Hi friends! Um, for our next couple of days, uh, we are going to scratch the surface of um, reading about Noah and the Flood. Okay, so if we're thinking about this through the themes of Lent, we um, are continuing to remember the rupture between what God intended for humanity and what humanity did with that. Um, we saw it in the garden, we saw it between the brothers um, Cain and Abel, and now we're going to see it big time um, in the wickedness that leads up to God uh, flooding the whole earth. Now, we could spend days, a long time, uh, studying just this story, um, and I want, but we don't, we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> we're just going to going to read through it um, with a, a few discussion points along the way, um, but I wanted to show you something that I uh, find very valuable when reading um, particularly Genesis, but the first five books of the Bible. Um, there is a, um, I guess traditionally, uh, you may have learned that Moses uh, wrote the first five books of the Bible, but um, kind of looking at it critically, it's um, very unlikely. Instead, there is something called the documentary hypothesis that um, sees key identifiers in the text that lead scholars to believe that, in fact, there are many sources that came together to form what we know as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, um, and that eventually those sources were put together into the coherent narrative that we have today. Um, except the narrative isn't completely coherent because there are parts where you're like, wait a minute, didn't you just say this and now you're saying this? And we're going to see that, um, the sort of discrepancies in the story of Noah in particular. But I wanted to show you this book, um, The Bible with Sources Revealed. And in it, they've kind of color-coded Genesis um, so that you can see where the different sources come into play. Um, and so today when we read um the story of Noah, we're really going to be noticing two of the sources kind of um, mixed in together. And I, again, I'd love to have a whole study on this, but we don't have time for that. Um, so I want to just say um, that we're going to be noticing the Yahwist source, which is often called the J source, and the priestly source, which is called the P source. Um, and you're going to see even you don't have to worry too much about Yahweh's and priestly sources, but I think you're going to be able to see how there are two different stories here being sort of tied together by um, uh, the editor, the redactor, who finally put put the whole whole thing together. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and start reading and see if some of this starts to make a little more sense. Okay, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Um, I'm going to be reading from probably a translation that's going to differ a little bit from yours, um, but hopefully you can uh, follow along with me. And Yahweh saw that human bad was multiplied in the earth, and every inclination of their heart's thoughts was only bad all the day. And Yahweh regretted that he had made humankind in the earth. So I want to stop there for just a second. Um, and I want to tell you um, something that you may not have noticed, or maybe you, ha maybe you have noticed, but you don't know why, in um, the biblical text that we read in English. Um, if you have ever noticed that in the Old Testament, sometimes you'll see LORD in all caps. So go ahead and look at verse 5 and 6 and see if you see that LORD in all caps. Um, that is actually sort of a signal that that's the divine name, Yahweh. Um, that in the text, Yahweh is that's what that's what it's representing. It's not just the um, sort of um, generic word Lord or God. It's God's divine name. Now, this is a clue that we're we're reading the J source. Um, the Yahwist uses Yahweh's name even in Genesis. The priestly source won't do that. I hope I'm not losing here. But the priestly source won't do that because in the story of um, God's relationship with God's people. God doesn't reveal the name Yahweh until we get to the book of Exodus. So you won't see the name Yahweh from the priestly source until God gives that name. Um, the Yahweh doesn't mind this anachronism of writing God's name before God gives it, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so we are, um, let's pick up at verse 6 again. And Yahweh regretted that he had made humankind in the earth, and he was grieved to his heart. Now, again, if we're thinking about this with our Lenten themes in mind, 
God is regretting creating the world. Like this is bad, right? We've really screwed this up, okay? Um, we've caused God to feel regret. Um, this is another thing to note about the Yahwist. Um, God has very um, human sort of emotions. Um, and so God here is feeling something we can identify with. God's feeling regret. Okay, verse 7. And Yahweh said, I'll wipe out the human whom I've created from the face of the earth, from human to animal to creeping thing and to the bird of the skies, because I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in Yahweh's eyes. Again, we see that this is part of our Lenten, thinking about um, sort of our Lenten themes. God is mad. This is really bad, right? Um, but there's this little little piece of hope. Noah found favor in Yahweh's eyes. This is the same as the mark of Cain and the clothes that God fashioned for Adam and Eve. There is not, God's not going to cut it off. God's not going to give up. God may be grieved and regret that he ever made the earth, but there's still hope. Okay. Um, verse nine, these are the records of Noah. Okay, so we saw in those first few verses, five through eight, sort of an introduction to who Noah is, okay? Um, the world is bad. Uh, Noah is going to be the one, the one good thing, right? And then we see this new introduction of who Noah is, and that's because we've changed sources, okay? All right, we're going to the blue. We're going to the priestly account of this same thing, okay? Noah was a virtuous man. He was unblemished in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth, I believe, is how our English translation um, our, I'm sorry, our, Christ, our Christian Bibles translate that. Um, again, I'm using a Jewish translation here. And the earth was corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and here it was corrupted because all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me because the earth is filled with violence because of them. And here I'm destroying them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms with the ark and pitch it outside and inside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. 300 cubits the length of the ark, 50 cubits its width, and 30 cubits its height. Now a cubit is the length of a, a grown man's forearm. So it's rough. <laughs> uh, you shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from the top, and you shall make the ark's entrance in its side. You shall make lower, second, and third stories for it. And I, here, I'm bringing the flood water on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under the skies. Everything that is in the earth will expire, and I shall establish my covenant with you. And you'll come to the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of all the living, of all flesh, you shall bring two of each to the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds of the birds by their kind, and of the domestic animals by their kind, of all the creeping things of the ground by their kind, two of each will come to you to keep alive. And you take some of every food that will be eaten and gather it to you, and it will be for you and for them for food. And Noah did it. According to everything that God commanded him, he did so. Okay, so I want you to notice a couple things here. Um, first of all, the priestly source is often concerned with... Um, lineage. So you see that, that he, the priestly sources were reporting um, exactly who Noah's family is. Um, also, they're concerned with kind of all these particulars, right? They like the details, and so we get the details about how the ark was supposed to be built, the instructions God gave. Um, I also want you to note that this is where we get the two by two, right? There's a song, right? The Lord said to Noah. Anyway, there's something about going two by two, twos, twos by twosies. Anyway, um, <laughs> so in the uh, priestly source, Two by two, okay? They need a male and a female because the purpose of bringing them onto the ark is simply to make sure that those um, species continue once the flood is over, right? But there's going to be a different number with the Yahweh's source, and that's where we're going back to now. We're going to start chapter 7, and we're going to be the Yahweh's now. Okay, chapter 7, verse 1. And Yahweh, you probably see all those capital letters, Lord, and Yahweh said to Noah, Come, you and all your household, into an ark, for I've seen you as virtuous in front of me in this generation. Okay, so we're getting kind of multiple instructions here, kind of a re repetition, and this, the, the multiple sources kind of account for why we're seeing this repetition when we just read it in our regular text. Okay, verse 2. Of all the pure animals, take seven pairs, man and his woman, 
and of the animals that are not pure, two, man and his woman. Also of the birds of the sky, seven pairs, male and female, to keep seed alive on the face of the earth. Because in seven more days I'll rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I'll wipe out all the substance that I've made from on the face of the earth. Okay, so um, the reason why the um, Yahweh source says seven of the, of the clean animals, here it says pure, but seven clean animals is because the Yahweh already lived under the assumption or, or already allows for the um, eating of the animals. Okay, so the Yahweh has a little bit of a different number here of how many animals are going to be gathered. You'll notice that seven um, pure or clean, seven pairs, and then only two pairs of the unclean. Um, well, the unclean animals you're not going to eat, right? And you're not going to sacrifice. Um, so you only need two of them to just continue the species. But the clean animals you might eat um, and you might offer to God in sacrifice. So you might, you'll need more of those, right? Um, but the Yahwist kind of allows that meat was eaten before the flood and that sacrifices were given before the flood. But the priestly source is committed to um, the uh, understanding that meat was not eaten until after the flood. In fact, we'll read that command tomorrow um, that they could eat the, eat the animals um, given after they've gotten out of the boat. Um, and also that sacrifices were only able to be made in the temple, right? You only sacrificed in the temple, except there is no temple. So obviously there can be no sacrifice, right? So um, you're just seeing kind of these, um, the agenda, maybe be too strong of a word, but um, the, the core commitments of these two different sources um, at play here. So um, the priestly source is not going to concede that you would need more than two animals because you're not going to eat them and you're not going to sacrifice them. Okay, so we're going to pick the story back up. And I want you to notice now that the colors are kind of, um, instead of those nice clean divisions, we're kind of seeing the story all tangled up here together. Okay, um, and so you can see if you can listen and see some of those markers that I shared with you that you can expect from the two sources. Let's pick up with verse 6. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood was, water on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him came to the ark from before the waters of the flood. Of the animals that were pure, and of the animals that were not pure, and of the birds and every one that creeps on the ground, they came by twos to Noah to the ark, male and female, as God had commanded them. Okay, so you notice there the pure and not pure. It's only going to be two by two. So which source do you think that is? It's the priestly source. Okay, verse 10. And seven days later, the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on this day, all the fountains of the great deep were split open and the apertures of the skies were opened. Okay, so that is also the priestly source. You're getting those really specific details. And in fact, the priestly source, um, the flood lasts for about a year, according to their, according to that source. Um, we'll use a corresponding detail tomorrow, I believe, to um, see how long it lasted. But the other thing to note here is that um, the priestly source is, I'm, I'm probably getting too far into the weeds with you here, but um, it is the first creation story um, in Genesis, where God is restraining the waters above from the waters below, right? Um, where God's speaking the world into being. And here we see that the, this flood is, an un, is, is sort of spoken of as if it's an undoing of creation. Whereas God had been restraining the waters above and the waters below to create, now God's like, forget it. I'm letting those waters do what they want to do. Let the chaos ensue. Creation is sort of breaking down. Okay. Verse 12, we're going to switch sources here. And there was rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So that is according to um, the Yahwist source, 40 days and 40 nights. And we probably talk about that the most when we talk about the flood. In this very day, Noah came and Shem and Ham and Japheth, Joseph's sons, and Noah's, I'm sorry, Noah's sons, not Joseph, Noah's sons and Noah's wives and his sons, three wives with them to the ark. They and all the wild animals by their kind and all the domestic animals by their kind and all the creeping animals that creeped on the earth by their kind and all the birds of their kind, all fowl, all winged things. And they came to Noah to the ark by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. And those that came were male and female. 
Some from all flesh came as God had commanded him. All right, so we kind of see these um, animals coming to the ark twice. All right. Um, and Yahweh closed it for him. All right, so, so God himself is going to close the ark. And the flood was on the earth for 40 days, and the waters multiplied and raised the ark, and it was lifted from the earth. And the waters grew strong and multiplied very much on the earth. And the ark went on the face of the waters. And the waters had grown very, very strong on the earth. So they covered all the high mountains that are under all the skies. Fifteen cubits above, the waters grew stronger. And they covered the mountains. And all flesh that creep on the earth, of the birds and of the domestic animals, and of the wild animals, and all of all the swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all the humans, expired. Everything that had the breathing spirit of life in its nostrils, everything that was on the ground died, and he wiped out all the substance that was on the face of the earth, from human to animal to creeping thing, and to the bird of the skies, and they were wiped out from the earth, and just Noah and those who were with him in the ark were left, and the water grew strong on the earth a hundred fifty days. Okay, so we're going to leave Noah there for today, and we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Um, thanks for bearing with me. I'm sorry if I got a little too uh, technical there, but um, I find it fascinating to kind of be able to see that there might be multiple storytellers in the in the text as we read it today. Um, let us continue thinking about uh, themes of covenant, of broken relationship, and of what restores relationship with God and with one another um, as we continue through this holy season. Please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you that... Um, we have this text that people have preserved for us for generations and generations so that we may study and learn more about the ways that you have related to your people. God, we know that we so frequently let down our end of the bargain, that we are abysmally bad at keeping our part of the covenant, but we thank you that you are faithful and we thank you for your continued reach out to humanity and your reach for us. We thank you for the ways you care for us, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. See you tomorrow.